In volume one of Christmas in My Heart, compiled and edited by Joe Wheeler, we find the story Gift of David by Lon Woodrum. Such a thing hasn't happened often, I suppose, but it did happen in Springfield that Christmas. And I'm not the only one who can tell you about it. Dr. Wallace Martin knows the facts, and so does Dr. Gaffel, the specialist, and Mrs. Carol DeVoe will vouch for it too. Frank Gammon, editor of the Daily Eagle, and my boss called me into his office that day and held out a slip of paper. Look, Al, run this down, he said. Kid dying of leukemia, won't live till Christmas, but he's all set to celebrate. Sounds like a story. You don't mind the old man's blunt words. It was just his way. We all knew he liked kids. I took the slip of paper and left the office. The slip said, David Stone, Mother Carol Stone. 1745 Elm Street. I went out on the street. A few big snowflakes drifted down on the still air like tiny white paratroopers. From the courthouse tower, Christmas music floated over Springfield. Driving down Sheridan, I passed Calvary Church, where I was a member. I saw my pastor, Alan Comer, going up the steps and waved at him. Wonderful fellow, that. He had shown me the way to a new life in Christ. I stopped my car at a white frame house. There was a small Christmas tree in the window. I rang the bell and the door was opened by a woman who looked a little younger than myself, around 30, with sea-colored eyes and dark hair drawn back from an intelligent, pretty face. She had a full mouth and was slim and nearly as tall as my own five feet eleven. I'm Al DeVoe from the Daily Eagle, I said. I'd like to have a talk with David Stone, if I may. Are you Mrs. Stone? Yes, she said. Why do you want to see him? Our editor has asked me to come. May I see him? She hesitated. I don't want his suffering smeared all over the papers. I'll handle the story properly, Mrs. Stone. I kept looking at her. Her pale skin stood out against her dark hair and her eyes were rather a contrast to both. Her eyes interested me. They were cold, yet they were trying to be warm. Something besides her son's illness seemed to be needling her. She led me into a bedroom to a boy propped up on pillows. He was about 10. The little fellow grinned at me and said, hi, mister, Merry Christmas. I tossed my hat on the bed. I'm Al DeVoe, Dave, how's things? Things are just fine, he said, even if I have to be in bed a few days. I glanced up and saw pain catch at the mother's face. She turned away from me. I said to David, are you, sh are you looking forward to Christmas? Sure, he grinned. It's a time for us to remember God's birthday. Jesus' birthday. Some people don't think of that fact first when they talk about Christmas. I believe in Jesus. Mother doesn't believe in him, but I do. Again, I glanced at Carol Stone, but she did not look at me. She went out of the bedroom. Why doesn't your mother believe in Jesus? I asked gently. Oh, she just doesn't. I can't make her understand. He paused and squinted at me. Maybe you could help me make her understand. He seemed to take it for granted that I was a Christian. I reached out and patted his slim shoulder. Maybe I might do that, pal. Tell me, do you mind being in bed at Christmas? Oh, it's not Christmas yet. Not quite. I'll be well by Christmas. I gazed at him. His dark eyes were like two bright stars in his pallid face. Well, that's swell, Dave. It really is. I have faith in God, he said simply. This, I thought, is quite a story. In the living room, I found Carol Stone gazing out a window. She turned and said, I can't bear all his brave talk about getting well by Christmas. Dr. Martin says there's no chance. Faith, I said, can sometimes do strange things. Faith. Harshness covered the softness of her voice. She lifted a slim hand. It sounds so well as a word, but it's pretty meaningless, really. I concentrated on her. You've had it tough, huh? Are you a reporter or a preacher? 
a reporter, but I wouldn't mind being a preacher. I think it's a great calling. She shrugged. Bitterness hardened a mouth that wanted to be tender. Don't preach here. I couldn't bear it. She sounded as if she might cry, and I said, I'm sorry I've disturbed you, Mrs. Stone. She shook her head. No, it's, it's all right. I'm just upset, not over you. The boy's father, I ventured, and stopped. She put a quick look on me and took a deep breath. David had a father, of course. I was married to him for four years. He was a religious man, very religious. She smiled sardonically. He ran off with a religious woman. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. But some religious people just aren't Christians, you know? She melted a little. She needed to talk. I've had a difficult time looking after David. I had a job with the American Insurance Company, but David's illness. She went to the coffee table for her purse and took out a handkerchief. His father name never came to see him? His father is dead. He was killed in an automobile wreck. David doesn't remember him, and I'm glad he doesn't. I twisted my hat brim in my hands. Life can be hard at times, but it takes a faith like David's to be equal to it. Poor little fellow. He's so sweet and so deceived. He really thinks he'll get well. He doesn't even know what leukemia is. I went to the door. If I can do anything, let me know, I said. She nodded but didn't say anything. I went to my car with David's face before me, and his mother's, too. The face of faith and the face of doubt side by side. Back at the Daily Eagle, I got a photographer to go out for a picture of David. Then I beat out the story. It ran the next day in the Eagle. The following day, it was picked up and flashed all over the country by the press. There were even a few editorials on it. Television and radio took it up, too. The old man sent me out for a follow-up story, and brother, when I got there, you never saw so many gifts pouring into one place. Packages, big and little and medium-sized. I waded through them into the bedroom, and there in the midst of more toys beamed a pale-faced David. Boy, he said, everybody is wishing me a happy Christmas. You've gotten to be an important fellow, I said. He grinned hugely. People care when you're sick, don't they? I stiffened and looked quickly at his mother. Sick? The people think you're going to die, Davy. They love you when they think you're going to die. A vast sadness washed through me, and for a moment I must have shared some of his mother's feelings. In the living room, she said, I don't think I can bear it. Because people have proved their sympathy for a boy like David? At least this proves everybody isn't like a guy who has made you so bitter. Her eyes narrowed. It proves nothing except that people are sentimental and swayed by publicity. I wish I hadn't let you run the story in the paper. I can't stand it, seeing all those gifts pouring in for a boy who'll never live to enjoy them. If people were human, they'd give to the living, not the dead. Listen. David had so little when he was well and able to run about. No father, sometimes barely enough to eat. Now, when he's bound to a deathbed, things come in like a flood. It's all so... so stupid. I left and went to the office of Dr. Wallace Martin. I knew him quite well, and he saw me. The boy has leukemia, Al, the doctor said. I made sure about it. I consulted with Dr. Gaffel, a top man in this field. The diagnosis is certain. Which is a way of telling me there's no hope for the kid, I muttered. There comes a time, Al, when we have to stand by and watch someone die. I paused at the door. Nothing on earth could help him, I suppose. On earth? He wagged his head. Not that I know of. From Martin's, I went to see Alan Comer. We talked about little David's case. Then I said, tell me, Pastor, how far can we go with the thing we call faith? How far? 
There's no limit, I suppose. The Bible says all things are possible to him that believes. Will you ask the church to pray for David? He nodded. Sunday morning, Al. That night, I wrote my second story on David. I put in the words of my pastor. I reported that the church was going to pray for David. The national press grabbed that story, too, and so did television. Letters poured in by the hundreds. People everywhere who believed in the power of prayer were praying for David. But when I went to see David again, I found his mother had suppressed the news in her home. David knew nothing about what was happening. You have no business doing a thing like that, I cried. Let the boy know that the people are praying for him. It will help his own faith. So he'll build up a false hope, then die? No! I can't endure this mockery. He's not your son. You don't know how I feel. I'm his mother. I wish you were my kid, I said softly. I'd like to have a kid like that someday. How he ever got to be what he is, though, with a father and mother like he's had is beyond me. Her eyes blazed. His father and mother? Yes. Please go. Go. I went out, and it was snowing pretty hard. I drove to my apartment, but I didn't go in. I began to walk. From far off, I heard a voice singing, Come, all you faithful. I thought of little David, and the tears stung my eyes. I raised my face and felt the snow cold on it. And I breathed a prayer to the God who came to a cattle shed to save mankind, to come to a kid who had leukemia. And standing there in the snow, praying, suddenly I felt as if he was in the world in a special way, as he had been that first Christmas and my heart trembled with a strange joy. I seemed to feel, too, the prayers of hundreds of people, all praying for little David Stone. I had never felt so lifted in spirit before in my life. They put me on a special assignment the next morning, and I had to leave Springfield. I returned a few days later to find the old man all excited. Al, you've really got a story now. I've been holding things back for you. It's your story, you know. What gives? Mrs. Stone phoned an hour ago. She asked for you. She says David is well. What? Don't stand there and gape. Get out there, man. I grabbed a phone. When a voice answered, I said, Dr. Martin, this is Al. What about David Stone? Have you seen him? Yes. There was a pause. I'm the one who told Mrs. Stone that David is all right. What happened? Mrs. Stone phoned me that David insisted on getting up, that he was well. She was wrought up, so I went out. He looked so good I took a blood specimen and checked, it, checked again with Dr. Gaffel. The boy doesn't have leukemia. But the diagnosis, you said it was certain. It was, Al, believe me. Well, what do you say? I am a scientist, Al. I don't know for sure whether the medicine we've given him had anything to do with the boy's recovery or not. I don't even know if the recovery will last. If you ask me frankly, I think all those prayers had something to do with it. Faith. Who knows what it might accomplish? I found Carol Stone weeping, but she smiled at me radiantly. Suddenly David stood in the doorway in pajamas said, Hi, Al. I feel fine. We're going to have a swell Christmas, aren't we, Mother? Carol ran and hugged him to her heart. Oh, yes, darling. We're going to have a wonderful Christmas. Wonderful. It's the day to remember God's birthday, said David. I sat down on the Davenport, and David came and sat down by me. He reached for my hand, then sat gazing happily at the Christmas tree. It's beautiful, he said, like God. Carol said, I should know more about him, shouldn't I? I put my arm about David's shoulders. I think Dave and I might be fair teachers, if you're listening. I'm listening. Later, as I drove back to the Daily Eagle through swirling snow, remembering the tender look on Carol's face and the new faith shining in her eyes, 
I knew this was going to be a very happy Christmas, indeed.